Okay. Um, John, another Lonely Planet person. Um, <laughs> product owner, which I've just figured out what that means. I'm <laughs> Chris, uh, the developer at a drink company. What's that? This is Raoul, he's an intern at CCH, uh, test analyst. Yeah. Testing. Yep. Cool. Um, we, we both work together with, again, two people from Lonely Planet. Okay. So Dan, who is um, a platform yeah. business analyst. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm Sue, an ops manager. Cool. Okay, well, <coughs> thank you very much for that. Um, I think it always helps to know, you know who's, who's around and uh, one of the, the best things that I like about these sorts of conferences is meeting lots of other people that you, know, you can connect with and learn from. Uh, a few years ago I went to KitCon, I mean, has anyone been to KitCon? Continuous Integration and Testing Conference. Um, similar kind of open space uh, sort of concept as a lot of this. And um, although it was slightly excruciating, the first night, um, so it starts on a Friday evening, there's a limited to 120 people uh, attending. Everyone went around like in a big circle and briefly introduced um, themselves. Uh, but what that meant is you could then go and meet that person and talk to them afterwards instead of just randomly having conversations with people who bump into other comments. So, uh, although that can be good too. Uh, so hopefully this session starts a few ongoing conversations through the rest of the day. Um, my name is Mark Pettison, I work with KDRS Associates, we're a software testing consultancy, I've uh, been running for 15, probably 15 plus years now, um, and I've been involved uh, with KDRS for pretty much most of that time. So I ended up in testing by accident, as most people do. Um, uh, someone asked me to write a test plan for uh, you know, some you know, HP you know, Unix server or other that was running some superannuation system that was about to all crash because of Y2K. Um, and I think the the qualification that got me the job was, hey Mark, you know some Linux, don't you? Do you think you could write a test plan? Um, and uh, everything was sort of progressed from, from there. Um, so what I wanted to facilitate more than, you know, sort of teach or anything like that is this sort of session on you know, how to add value as a, as a quality geek. So there's a few people who, who self-identified as testers in, in the room, yeah, okay, but quite a few developers, yeah, and a few product owners, project managers, etc. And presumably everyone is involved in some sort of agile process, that's generally why people are here. Well, how many people are not practicing Agile at all, and are here because they're interested. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Join the table. Um, so, the way that I hope we can um, run this session is that I'm not coming bearing <coughs> pearls of wisdom, um, but more like um, provocations, little bits of grit uh, to uh, to put into the oyster, and hopefully at the end we get some, some pearls out. Um, so we uh, have testing teams working with various organisations all around the country and what I've tried to do is distill some of their experiences, uh, positive or negative, uh, and just share some of those sort of stories. So as we go through, I'm going to ask each sort of table to um, have a bit of discussion and hopefully I can see that there's people who've got a few bits of note paper or whatever. So, um, uh, as I sort of throw out an idea or a topic, um, have a bit of discussion, make a few notes, and what we'll do is, um, hopefully we can, it's not too much of a scramble, just get a few bullet points. So I'll, I'll sort of scribe on the whiteboard when we sort of debrief from each of those sessions. So in that way, we'll sort of generate some content that we can kind of um, publish or share via the last conference we'll do in that sort of thing. So it helps to hopefully improve our, our general understanding of these sorts of issues. Um, so let's dive into it. Uh, so the, the testers in the, in the room, are you, you're working as part of an Agile team? 
know Rob is. No? Really? Um, I think for one of the things that I notice, and it's, it's good to see this uh, actually some testing topics at this conference, because if I compare that to, say, um, KidCon a few years ago here in Melbourne, we had 100, um, you know, 119 developers who were all really keen about testing, and I think I might have been the only tester uh, in the room. And uh, I think that testing as a discipline has lagged quite a long way behind, um, so the agile world and you know, trying to adopt things. So a lot of the questions that come up are around uh, how does a tester really fit into an agile team? So to sort of prompt us into um, you know first point of discussion, some of the problems that I've noticed with um, our testers coming into organisations who've decided that oh we're going agile. Um, and maybe they already are agile, or maybe they're already fragile, or something like that. Um, and they decide they need some testers, and so then the testers come and join, but often there's situations like this. So the testers are engaged uh, for the last part of the sprint, or for the last part of the project sort of cycle, because, well, we don't really need testers at the start, um, we just need to write some code. So there's a sort of mixture of waterfall and agile. And you see that all of the time where people are, oh, we're developing an agile, but we test at the end. Um, and so you end up with, you know, a lot of difficulty really understanding what's the user story, whatever documentation there may be, it's probably out of date compared to where things are at now, because people haven't been part of the journey. Um, and testing becomes a big bottleneck at the end. So you know, agile is a lot about relationships. So I've you know, I see that as a problem that exists between the, you know, the relationship between testers and PMs or BAs. You don't really sort of see the value of having that person there all the time. The other challenge that I've seen come up quite frequently within uh, testing, uh, also agile teams, is testers kind of don't fit because it's a very developer-centric logo. Uh, culture. Uh, so a few things um, can come up there. One, sometimes the assumption uh, that either team leads, project leads, and um, developers may make is that, oh great, we're getting some testers, they're going to write all my unit tests for them. Um, so that's, that's often, has anyone been in that sort of situation? Um, so that's, that's one thing that, that pops up. Um, sometimes the assumption is, why do we need testers anyway? We do all this automated unit testing, isn't that enough? Um, anyone here think that they actually don't need any testers? Anyone not got testers? Oh, everyone's got testers. So that, that's an important distinction between the activity of testing and the role and the person being tested. Okay, yeah. yeah. So you always need testing. And at the moment, most of the skills around testing live with people who are professional testers. But, yeah, so, uh, and there's, it's, there's some interesting things we're going to talk about with skills as, as, we, as we go along. Sorry. There's certainly a few teams that I know that don't have any professional testers where the testing role is integrated into the development role. Yeah. Um, or potentially just outside of the, you know, like a product owner role or a VA role, right. where they kind of do those things as yeah. part of their they help define the stories and then they yeah. also help make sure that it met the criteria that they expected it to. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Okay, so, and it is good to, to tease out sort of like the role doesn't necessarily have to be a full-time uh, person. Uh, I think this is one of the challenges that sometimes happens when people who are professional testers who haven't come from an agile background try to go into an agile team and work out where do I add value. Um, the other thing that I notice, particularly with that, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this doesn't come up so much um, when you've got product owners or people who are already part of the organisation playing the testing role, but it certainly happens if you're a tester coming in to join a team. If you don't know exactly, straight away, how to use the IDE, how to check code in and out, um, how to compile things, um, then suddenly you can lose all credibility. Um, and just useless and a 
burden to the team and you're slowing us down. So that could be the attitude that some of the, the testers that I've worked with who join the teams um, have to struggle to overcome. And sometimes after a few weeks, then it becomes a little bit better and people start to see, oh, okay, you've done some useful things. Uh, but there's that initial first impression um, can be hard to, to overcome. So, um, so this is a little sort of um, set of ideas. Um, we're in function of widescreen format here with the projection. Um, um, that we'll, I'm going to keep coming back to. But if we start off with looking at things like user stories, where do testers sort of add value? So a lot of it is around collaboratively clarifying the stories, identifying hidden assumptions, um, asking questions to really work out what's the right quality level, how important is this, and working to um, define acceptance criteria. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I see it's really important for testers to be engaged early, um, to work to define acceptance criteria. And one of the, the organisations we're working with that was the big transformation from being called in to do some testing at the end of the project to suddenly being engaged all the way through. And for the first two days of a project initiation, our test lead would grab the BA and basically chain them to the desk and um, convert uh, all of the requirements that the BA had developed into um, sort of clear given when then uh, style of acceptance criteria. So mini stories. Is any, how many people are using a, any kind of BDD or given when then sort of way of expressing? Yep, majority of people in the room. So that's um, uh, been a significant sort of shift within that uh, particular organisation. And what that has also helped them to do is improve their planning. Um, so now they've got a much better idea of what is uh, uh, what it is they're trying to do within the sprint, uh, including the testing effort. Um, and as one of our other um, uh, sort of agile test leads, sort of had a, a, a terse conversation with the, the dev lead. He was talking about velocity, etc., etc. Try to work out what the velocity was, and uh, Craig. So like, I can tell you what the velocity is, it's zero, because you guys have written lots of code, but we haven't actually managed to finish testing anything in the sprint yet. So you know, tying testing into the idea of what's actually done uh, and having uh, an incorporation of testing into those estimates is really important. Uh, one last little bit of thoughts before we keep back into some discussion. So, one of the areas, and I think this is true across the whole industry, regardless of where, whether you're um, doing agile or not, requirements is one of the main areas where we experience waste within IT. Um, uh, we do a national survey of software testing practice, um, and results from that indicate that at least 20%, about 20 to 25% of defects are originating with poor requirements or wrong requirements. Um, and then another 20, uh, 10 to 20% come in terms of um, poor design, so poor specification. Sort of thing. So it's not that all the, the errors get introduced at the code level. A lot of it is much, much earlier. And yet the majority of the testing that we do is way down in sort of system testing after all the code's been written. So, Areas where testers can really add value is in scrutinising requirements and taking that devil's advocate sort of view. So it's often the role of the tester, and this is, I think, one of the key differentiators between a tester, if you like, a professional tester and someone who's having to play the role of the tester. Professional testers, by nature, generally are pessimists, or we describe ourselves as realists rather than optimists. So usually if you're the 
VA or a developer or a product owner, you're enthusiastic about the next new features and what's going to happen. Um, it's really the role of the tester to try and pull that apart and ask things like, what's the real business value? And do my acceptance criteria really line up with something that's going to improve the bottom line of this organisation? Um, and making sure that that's what we're looking for. Um, is there a, if the story can't really hang together, then maybe this shouldn't even be a feature. So, you know, be prepared for a tester who's adding real value to your team to be a sceptic and to argue with you about whether this is a good idea and why should we have this story within our consideration. The value of that comes from if you don't really examine a story very well and you just sit down and start writing uh, code, uh, then often as you go along, you'll go, ah, oh, what does that really mean? And suddenly there's a whole lot of extra acceptance criteria and the whole thing um, can turn into three, four, or five additional sub-stories. Um, and it really blows all of your planning for that iteration out of the water. So what I want to ask you to do now is have some discussion, um, uh, generating some, some pearls of wisdom. Those of you who are testers may be able to share some testing sort of stories, but um, regardless of that, uh, within your teams, can you think of situations where you experienced waste um, in terms of requirements? So requirements that really weren't very clear, um, that blew out um, estimates, and or, or conversely, situations where there was something that um, wasn't clear, but then it was questioned and, and, and targeted um, early on, and then that saved you a lot of problems. So either of those two scenarios. And see if you could come up with a small list of what are the questions that should be being asked. Because again, not everyone's going to have a tester in the room, but without this we can come up with some guidelines for what we, you know, the sort of questions we should be asking, then I think that's going to be helpful. So let's spend, say, probably five minutes um, uh, diving into that. And yeah, yeah, feel free to play music with chairs.
But there's something that we can uh, because sometimes uh, the owners are yeah. sponsored to say no and what they want. They think this is wrong, the world is wrong. Okay, has any, any table got anything different to add? I'm going to pick up different tables for different topics as we go. Something. What, something what we do is to um, identify edge cases and identify which ones are in and which ones are out. Cool. 
Do you want to briefly explain for everyone who may not hear across what an edge case is? Right, so there's, the, like so there's the main purpose of the story, which is to be able to get from A to B, but along the way from A to B, there might be different things that the user might do to get there, and so, you know, if they type in something that you might not expect, then, or if they press buttons that you might not expect, then you can just say, well, all those cases are, in, are just out, but just potentially this first card might be just a happy path of, they go directly from A to B. Like the minimal viable spec, yeah. so the, most, the, the least that you can build on one card. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, keeping it very simple rather than dealing with all of the possible user interactions. Anyone else got anything extra? Talking about the waste of the... Yeah, so it's related to requirements and so forth. So you know, particularly thinking about what are the questions that you can ask at that stage. We um, saw what we're trying to do is do the elaboration with everyone there. Yep. Not by one person on the yep. train or by a small injury, but leaving the bulk of the elaboration when everyone's together and happy and understand what's about. One, um, one of our other guys who's quite a, a, a zealous uh, tester and a zealous agile advocate uh, was very frustrated uh, with the way that an agile team was not actually functioning in a good agile way at all. And, um, the acceptance criteria in particular were really unclear and not testable and all sorts of things. So he actually sort of more or less went on strike. So as the, as the test lead within that Agile team, he forbade all the testers from testing any car that had been elaborated without a tester as part of the conversation, um, just to sort of prove the point. And then very quickly the elaboration of the acceptance criteria improved a lot because they all became a lot more testable. Um, so it's maybe not the sort of action you would take every time, but um, <laughs> in extreme cases. Um, so I'm very conscious of time, so we have to keep on going. So after, you know, maybe there's acceptance, um, you know, the tester has sort of worked out that, okay, I've got a role to play. Um, where do we go next? Estimation of planning, um, I think is the, is the next Thing, and I'll, I'll try and keep this one, you know, fairly fairly brief. Uh, generate a bit more discussion before we have to finish. Um, so, you know, when it comes to estimation, there's two things you really got to think about: how many tests to write, and how long they're going to take to write. Um, and I think this is also a challenge uh, for testers. Uh, and I, I did overhear some people just talking before about, um, you know, on the one hand, testers are really good at generating lots and lots of tests, um, sometimes far more than what other people would think of, and a lot of it comes into the happy path versus the unhappy path. That's where the, the tester mentality, we're usually pretty good at thinking about all of the unhappy paths. Um, but sometimes that can be overwhelming, that can be too much. So. I think a key thing is always around risk. So um, if it's a lower priority sort of item, then let's just focus on the happy path uh, scenarios, not go too much into making the test there. But if it's a high risk feature, uh, something that's much more business sensitive, then we really do need to you know, try and bulletproof that as much as possible. Um, whether it's, that's done all in one go or gradually, um, as John was talking about, is Thing. And the other aspect is just to try and get a handle on the complexity of um, a particular screen or a particular path, and how many branches are there, that's going to drive things up. So a lot of estimation does still come down to experience, but um, there are much more formal techniques that you can use to try and uh, drive out the best cases you want to write. How long is it going to take? Again, that's going to be experience. Um, if you look at people like Ross Collard's study of testing, um, it's very sobering because he, he found, not, not just theorised, but by surveying people, um, studying their behaviour quite closely, you've got an overhead of between four and even as much as eight times um, uh, prep effort to the actual testing. So if you're going to spend one day testing, you might spend four days preparing for that. Um, uh, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about planned versus exploratory testing in a moment. Um, but you know, automation then 
adds more overhead again. So the questions that uh, that I've got is that can you think of situations in a, in a sprint where or an iteration where you suffered um, because of poor estimation where things actually took a lot longer and particularly around um, bottlenecks with testing. So I'm interested in your experiences of what worked and also what didn't work. Was there, was there too much testing being done? Um, was there not enough understanding of how much testing is required when you went into a script? Um, Just before we do that, thing, yeah. we're talking about manual testing versus automated testing. Yeah. In your experience in projects that you go on, what is kind of the focus? Like, or what's the balance between those two? Okay, I'm going to talk about manual and automated in okay. a moment, but um, generally speaking, you often end up with about 50-50 in Agile, or it could be higher. It could be, you know, depending on the style. If you're really doing like a cucumber BDD sort of process and you've got testers who are very skilled, then your automation levels could be more like 80% or something like that. But often, it's, it ends up being about half and half. Um, As in, of their time? Yeah. Um, uh, and, it, yeah, we'll talk a bit more about automation when we, when we dive into it. But yeah, just take a few minutes now just to, to think about estimation. And again, the, the pearls of wisdom that we're trying to extract are um, what are the right questions to be asking to get an accurate estimate? So if we, if we can come up with you know, the, the 10 questions that we should ask that are a good <coughs> testing focus, then that's going to be a, a good result for this session. So let's do this quickly because I've got the next speaker in the room, so I can't afford to go over <coughs>
Yeah, for us, so we have, at the moment, we have like two or three times. <laughs> 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 Okay, so we've already got people eagerly trying to come in for the next session, so I've got two more topics that I want to talk about, I think we might have to get one of them. Um, uh, so briefly, I'm going to, I think, um, I think I've estimated, um, estimation, any pearls of wisdom from you guys? Well, I think that, I mean, for us, for estimation, we actually don't really modify our estimates, but what we do do is break out cards, so yep. the, the main card might become even more happy happy path yep. than it might have been originally intended and we try and carve cards off that just aren't part of this one to try and keep the to keep the cards small. Yeah. But it doesn't really include, at least in our process, it doesn't really include anything to do with the, the amount of time that it will take to test. Right. It's more about the, the overall Yeah, like the end-to-end -end process yeah. where the assumption is that testing will take the same amount of time per card, I guess. Yeah. Which yeah. isn't, I think, probably true. Yeah, I'd say I'd say it's probably not true. But it's a it's, it's a good good enough working assumption to start with. In, in, in actual fact, if you look at um, overall studies, it's not agile specific. Um, but testing and development usually do take about equal amounts of time. So, and the, especially in waterfall projects, they're never given equal amounts of time. But that's what it ends up taking. So, uh, so it's not a bad assumption. Anyone got something that you want to add? Yeah. Um, I, I really like the idea of like, over time of, of the estimation. The value is not size of the things. The value is in forcing you to split things. Yep. Yeah. So I don't care if something's eight points of error. It's, it's, it's not so much about the size of the task. It's about figuring out enough about that thing. Yeah. To create some pieces. Yeah. So sort of keeping constant velocity. So just breaking things down to a level where you have more even sized stories around things and you're, you're making them appear earlier rather than later as you discover that stuff and what you're doing. Welcome, we're just finishing off this session but you're welcome to sit in and we'll be done in a moment. Because I think what I will do with Rob's permission is we'll tackle I had two more topics, we'll just tackle the automation one, because some people had questions about that, and it sort of leads I'll, into, I'll get set up, yeah. leads into um, to Rob's session. So, okay, so the other thing I was going to talk about was, you know, sort of designing tests and sort of planned versus exploratory. Um, I think there's enough of that floating around that we don't need to discuss, but people were asking about uh, automation, um, and this is a hopefully a good primer for, for what Rob's going to be talking more about. My opinion is that testing within an agile context requires automation. You have to be able to do it. The paradox is that um, doing test automation in an agile um, setting is one of the hardest things to do in terms of automation um, because you usually want to automate something that's stable and uh, not changing very much and that's not what agile software 
generally is. It's always changing. So you've got to have some very specific um, uh, approaches to automation to make it work within, within Agile, which we hopefully will become a little bit clearer. Um, so I see it as essential for testers, particularly professional testers, to have some automation skills. And it might be that there's a dev or an automation specialist who is maintaining a library that enables the automation, but certainly testers need to be able to write automation. Uh, do, you, do you think there's still a place for totally manual testers? Uh, yeah, yeah. So you don't, I think it, you can have the mixture within the team, um, but yeah, certainly there's a, there's a place for totally manual testers, but one of the things that I think we will see more and more of is that even people who would say, oh, I'm just a manual tester, if they could write a manual test script, if you build your automation in a sensible way, then they can write the high level automation script. They don't have to cut code that pull things out and divs and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, but they can write um, tests that will be automated. Uh, and I think that's important. So if someone's Oh no, I don't do that. I think that they're limiting. That's a career limiting move in terms of those sorts of things. Um, and certainly, having automation that feeds into your continuous integration is really important. Um, probably the only point that I want to make there is that, in our experience, once you get the automation really humming, um, devs will often pair up with a tester uh, rather than okay, I'm going to commit everything into continuous integration and then see all the big stuff happen or not. Um, and if they've not got all of the, they might have unit tests running on their machine but not all of the end-to-end -end tests that a test is working on, then devs will ask someone, hey, I've just checked in, uh, or I've got this code, can you check it out and run it um, you know, during the day? Especially if you're running like your bigger end-to-end -end automation scripts only once a day, which is quite common. Um, so rather than breaking into small groups, um, has anyone else got sort of comments that they want to sort of throw in around automation in terms of where it's worked or not worked for you? I think it's quite tricky when you say one role is responsible for automating the tests. Because when you when you develop something, you typically do it in very tight loops so you yeah. can write a test make it pass, write a test, make it pass. We do that at unit level, but we also expand that out to features like yeah. numbering, acceptance tests. Yeah. So it gets really hard to fit a process into that where you say someone writes all the stuff up front yeah. and then it goes in. you tend to write chunks at a time? Yeah, and maybe I should need to clarify. Um, uh, I don't... <coughs> I don't see, I, I, that's why I'm saying that manual testers need to be prepared to sort of write like the cucumber level, you know, sort of feature files, et cetera, that, that will be automated if you're using cucumber, and we'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, you may have one person who's sort of like the library um, of, the, of the automation code, um, just because that, and that's not about writing the test for the features, it's about sort of maintaining the automatability of the application, if you like. Yeah, it seems to be, that ends up being everyone who touches the code as well. Yeah, so there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a way of doing that, which is, you know, okay, developers assume responsibility for making sure that the code that they write is also automatable. So you maintain the library that goes with your feature code, um, so you can do it that way. Cool, all right. Well, we're pretty much out of time. Um, so hopefully you've found a few pearls of wisdom. We've got a few things um, you know, extracted and, and on the board and we'll try and document that wherever it goes on the wiki. So I should hand over to Rob, who'll go further into the automation uh, topic. Um, <coughs> certainly I see having that dedicated testing role as something that can add a lot of value um, in terms of helping quality issues to be visible to the whole team and really driving a focus on quality. Um, talking about quality, I'm going to fit in a little plug, shameless plug, uh, at the end. Uh, so there's another conference, this one coming up in Sydney. Um, so uh, this is more of a major, you know, two-day big event uh, kind of conference. Uh, we've got Michael Palatas from eBay. Uh, so he's been uh, one of his team members invented Selenium Grid, 
um, and things like that. So he's very involved in agile test automation. Uh, Scott Barber from uh, Perf Test Plus, some of you may know his name, uh, very involved in performance testing, particularly in agile settings. Um, so that'll be worthwhile doing. We'll be hearing more of the Seek story there. Um, so we'll have a focus on BDDs, including a workshop. Um, and for people who are attending this conference, um, there is a discount code. So if you want to register, um, last comp one, if you're doing a one day registration, or last comp two, if you're doing a two day registration. So these give you discounts off even the early bird price. Early bird's finished, but um, so the one day discount code will give you 50 bucks less than the early bird price, two days, 100 bucks less than the early bird price. So enough plugging. Uh, these are my contact details. Uh, they're obviously on uh, last comp as well, so feel free to get in touch and uh, I'll hand you over to Rob. Thank you very much. Thanks.